Let's Get Two presents Go, Go Astro! Go, Go Astros! A focus on H Town Hardball. And it is Monday. We are back here for another episode of Go, Go Astros. Andy's here. Brian is here. And we're all, Brian, just decidedly ho hum after another, you know, eight and two last 10 games rolling out there. Jordan hitting home runs. It's just, it's just what happens, right? It's, um, you know, there's a decidedly better vibe than I think there was last week. On the other hand, there's still this sense of, you know, everything we care about is still several weeks away. Uh, they will cleanse the division this week, and uh, that will be something we should enjoy and they should enjoy. And, and he's shaking his head at me. But the magic number's one, Brian. Aren't you? Isn't the anticipation palatable for you that we might clinch the AL West for the fifth time in six? I guess I don't care. This is the problem being a numbers guy, is I've known the fan graph odds have been 100% for three months now. And, uh, I, I was just, I was remarking after the game yesterday, which was, you know, a blowout as it should be against the Oakland A's triple A team, probably a double A team at this point. Um, and it's, you know, realized I was doing some counting and I got a little ahead of myself and thought, oh, we could clinch today. Oh, we can't clinch today. It'll be one. And then I realized that nobody cares that we're about to clinch the division. I mean, I am sure. And I, I felt bad for the rookie players. I felt bad for the younger guys who don't get the big dog pile on the mound because that's the first time in 20 years that their franchise has done anything. Seattle's going to have a blast provided they don't continue to collapse and somehow back at, back out of the playoffs. We'll get there. Yeah, you know what's funny is you're right. And in, in, it is something that I'm having to fight with myself to also not get fallen into the sort of this is a thing that happens because we have to recognize that it's not a thing that happens. And that the run the Astros on is actually rather unprecedented. And we really should just in, it really celebrate every single um, step along the way. And I remember um, in the heyday of Longhorn football, when Mac Brown was here, he used to always make a big deal about being bowl eligible. They would go on to win 10, 11 games, but he would mm-hmm. always make a big deal to be bowl eligible. And I think I actually think we should kind of make a point of stopping and celebrating every little milestone. I mean, but weren't y'all bowl eligible before the Oklahoma game every year? So, I mean, it was like really the lowest possible goal. We right, we reached it. it really no, I, and that's, and I, no, I, yes, you're right. And I think it's just that to my point is you should celebrate every step because you don't know which, Brian, you don't know when, you don't know if it's going to actually be this good next year. Well, and my analogy, uh, my college football analogy is being an LSU fan. When we won the SEC for the first time in years in, in 2001, it was this just sort of magical thing of like, I can't believe this happened. And, you know, that, that you know, we, we've said this is a sleeping giant. In 2003, they won the national title for the first time. And it was just, you know, as an LSU fan, we spent the last decade going like, are we supposed to win the national title like every year? Why aren't we Alabama? And it is a lot less fun to be an LSU fan. And I don't want it to be less fun to be an Astros fan. Yeah, uh, but you don't have yeah, expectations in October. To that point, we just don't. You're we're not we're not exercising the ghost of Jerry Donardo. I mean, and that's what you have as an LSU fan in that scenario, and it was great. And I hope someday that A and M will actually win more than eight games in a season, and I'll get to feel what that's like. Um, but it's just kind of okay. Let's just not get hurt these next three weeks. Hopefully, Jordan can get to forty home runs. That's really all I'm watching at this point. Is Jordan's Jordan's going to bat? Maybe he's going to hit five home runs today. I mean, the the funny thing is, too, is is looking at the standings and looking at how the weekend went, you know, even the whole race for the number one seed is now almost anticlimactic, right? Seven and a half game lead, just under three weeks to go. It would take an epic collapse to even lose that. It It, it really is where we don't think this team on paper is as good as 2019, yet they're actually one game better than 2019. And Brian, you and I are talking about this, too. Um We've not had a lo- losing streak longer than four games. Like, this has been the model of consistency. Yeah, and by the way, that losing streak was in April. So if you don't remember it, that's part of why, is that it was <laughs> so long ago. Uh, ended with the Jeremy Pena walk-off on my birthday. Thank you for the gift, Jeremy. Um, and so it's been a, as we talked about, a model of consistency and professionalism. And, yeah, it is probably less fun for, you know, Cal Tucker or Jeremy Pena that they don't get to go to that dog pile this week. On the other hand, they're like, this is just what baseball teams do. 
is they win a lot of games. They take care of business. They do things professionally. They don't have a lot of drama and they move on to the next round. And that'll be good for them too, as they, you know, become more veteran players and become more team leaders and transmit that to the rookies who come up three, four years from now. It's kind and, of I, and I should, I should clarify too, that Julian Morales did report that they will do the, they will do the, the clocker room celebration. They didn't do it after the playoffs. They'll do it after the division. And I think that's, I think that's fair, especially when 18 teams make the playoffs these days. Andy. Well, my, my perverse, my perverse hope today is that the uh, Mariners lose during the middle of the game and they just start breaking out the bottles in the dugout in like the second inning in Tampa. They're just I getting mean, hammered. It might be one of the only ways to tolerate playing in Tropicana Field. So, <laughs> especially if what happens at Tropicana Field, Andy and I are kind of hoping happens, but we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, New York, again, it seems now they are a team. We know who they are. The Yankees, that's how that's how dull this is on GoGo Astros. We're going to talk about the Yankees right now. But um, it does seem like anytime they play a team with playoff aspirations, they don't win. They lose. Um, that happened again this week against Milwaukee, losing two of three. But I saw the dumbest, the dumbest thing on Yankees Twitter, and I wanted you guys to dive into it. Um, for one – I'm on the record. I'm rooting for Judge to hit 61. I want Pujols to hit 700. I think it's good for the game. And even though, like I said on Twitter, even though Judge has been a bit of a putz, I actually still kind of like him as a player. Um, his his uh, lack of understanding baseball the last few years notwithstanding. But the, the take I've seen on Twitter by several people is, it's too bad Barry Bonds cheated because we should be enjoying this more than we are. What? I just, first of all, Yankee fan, worried about steroids? Well, he's letting Sammy Sosa off the hook here. <laughs> it's just, yeah, but talk about that for a second, Andy. Like, is that one of the dumbest things you've ever heard? Because it, it was for me. Uh, and, and to I've the point that this. I openly mocked a good friend of mine with just a bunch of different laughing gifts when he posted it. And, and, you know, it's part of the why I don't want to – be on Twitter ever and I find myself on it more and more and it's just it hurts my soul at different levels about different topics um all right let's just take Barry Bonds out of it um Mark McGuire hit 70 in 1998 Sammy Sosa hit 66 in 98 Mark McGuire hit 65 in 1999 Sammy Sosa hit 64 in 2001 Roger Maris hasn't held this record in 20 years 25 years so well, why are they case? singling out Bonds then and not Maguire? That's interesting. Or Sosa. Or, or Sosa. Sosa, yeah. I mean, we've had a number of people pass up Roger Maris, who, by the way, got death threats from Yankees fans while he was trying to break a Yankees record. Um, we're so. we're going to get to that in one second, too. But, Brian, your take on that, is it just – is, 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 is it a fan base turn so desperate to win anything that they're just – I don't know. I can't speak for Yankee fans because, well, you know, I try to avoid them uh, despite not being able to do that. Um, and one of the things I've learned over time is enjoy things and enjoy things that you like and don't worry about what other people say about it. And I feel like when we were teenagers, there was, you know, this one thing we all have to pay attention to, that there was sort of this dominant narrative from the media I'll put that in quotes here and today we don't have to live like that right we can you know be in our own sort of realities and ignore dumb takes and ignore people doing stuff and try to elevate the stuff that we like and you know it is you know yeah you know, it's hard to avoid that sometimes right but we can still promote ourselves and stuff that is so hey Aaron Judge hit two home runs yesterday, right? He hit that massive one for number 59, which was just awesome to watch, including, and I saw this from Yankee fans on Twitter, uh, they're very much enjoying the reaction of Luis Perdomo, uh, who threw the pitch going, like, why am I so stupid? Why did I throw that pitch to Aaron Judge? Andy, first of all, he should not see a pitch to hit in the playoffs at all, but continue. Sorry. No, my problem is not Yankees fans because – Obviously, if Jordan Alvarez was at 59, we'd be all very excited about Jordan Alvarez being at 59, even though he would still be 15 homers away from the record. We're not going to talk about that. Um, my problem is that Major League Baseball seems to also think 
that Judge is chasing some record that he's not chasing because he is 15 home runs away from the person they acknowledge as an organization is the single season leader in Barry Bonds. So if you don't like Barry Bonds, great. You've still got McGuire and Sosa who passed up Maris three times each before <laughs> you have to worry about Aaron Judge doing something. So if Aaron Judge hits another one tonight or tomorrow, he ties Babe Ruth for 60. That's a big deal historically, but yeah. it's not a record. But Major League Baseball literally sends something to my phone every time this guy comes up to bat right now. Well, well the funny thing was to that end, this is what kind of what I want to touch on next is our mutual friend Emily Nyman actually called out Buster Olney for saying that Aaron Judge was handling the stress so much better than Maris because Maris's hair was falling out, completely ignoring that it was because he was getting death threats. And it was it had nothing to do with the pressure of Babe Ruth. It had everything to do with people were going to kill him and his family. Um, and I, I, I love that Emily called that out. All you have to do is watch the excellent film 61 to learn that. Uh, Brian, we'll start with you because Andy looks frozen and angry and I want to keep that look. I'll, I'll just I'll just sort of add this brief thing here. Like, Part of the reason that Maris was targeted by so many people is it's Mantle who was supposed to do it. Mantle was the golden boy. I think that's literally the title of one of his biographies. Uh, and he was sort of you know, the hero and the star, and Maris kind of came out of nowhere. And part of why it's different for judges, I guess Giancarlo Stanton is the, you know, the other guy like that, but a judge is the fair-haired boy and the beloved boy of, of Yankee fans and fans around baseball for all sorts of good reasons. He hits the ball really far. He is really athletic. And so, yeah. But in general, we should be sympathetic to Roger Maris. And uh, he, yeah. Well, the, the the whole Maris thing was because Yankees fans didn't feel that he was Yankee enough to deserve the record. And he was in a battle with Mickey Mantle for most of that summer for the home run lead, and he, he broke away from him. But it, the death threats all came because, A, you're taking away something from Babe Ruth, Yankees legend, um, also Alcoholics Anonymous legend without the anonymous part, uh, hot dog eating legend. I mean, great uh, child rearing legend out of wedlock. Um, all Babe those Ruth, things. Joey Chestnut right there. That's yeah, the, I mean, he's right up there uh, in James Coney Island or the Coney Island. Um, it's it, it, I Maris had death threats from Yankees fans again because he wasn't Yankees enough. He came over from the A's and he doesn't deserve it. Judge gets a pass, and I guess Stanton got a pass five years ago in 2017 when he was chasing it. But yeah. it's just it, it 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 boggles my mind how much we're trying to make this a thing. It's a great individual accomplishment. I still think that Shohei Otani should win the MVP. Well, we look. I, what I think is frustrating even more about this particular part of the narrative is it's what's being pushed by mainstream respectable media. Like if it's a Yankees podcast like ours popping off at that, then Dude. I more power to you. Let's talk about Jordan winning the MVP. But the fact that it's coming right from what we what we what we all acknowledge or supposed to acknowledge as one of the mainstays in baseball media is, makes it even extra more frustrating. But it kind of proves the point we've been talking about on the show for years that there is a a organization that will always get the benefit of that out public public publicity wise. I mean, and that's before you get into the conspiracy theories about one team getting balls that are slightly, slightly different than the rest of the teams in Major League Baseball. Because the what, next what closest about, person, uh, Kyle Schwarber, has, what, 20 fewer home runs? Yeah. There's also been that suspicion or that conspiracy theory about why Pujols has exploded in the last three or four weeks. I don't know how much that's true, but it does seem like Pujols should be getting more of the story than Judge right now because – He's been considered a, a good guy in the game for almost 20 years. And and yet yet he's that yet that record's almost going, you know, dismissed, Brian. Um yeah, some of it's the disbelief that we sort of knew that Pujols could do this if he had a good season, but we all thought he was done. And and good news for baseball, he wasn't. It's been a really sort of fun story. And yeah. I hope he gets to uh, 700, and uh, I'm sure Brad Lidge really hopes he gets to 700. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on back to our division because, and and I this this actually stems from the broadcasting class I teach, and I shouldn't be like using this show as a um, a platform to say in your face to a high school student, but I'm going to anyway. 
he keep kept trying to me to get me to sort of fall into this whole uh, are you afraid of the Mariners narrative? He's a Giants fan, so I don't know why he cares. And I kept trying to say, first of all, I'm not really afraid of anybody. It's a spectator sport. But second of all, my concern is going to be against the Blue Jays and the Rays, one team that has a winning record against us, one team we haven't seen yet, versus a team we went 12-7 and seven against. Um, the Mariners, since that time, they are, let's see, five and four and six in their last, last 10 – um, they are fading. Andy, any chance they missed the playoffs in your mind? And second question, how big of a collapse would that be in your mind? It would be a collapse fitting for a team that has not made the postseason in 21 years, and I'm totally here for it. Unfortunately, the likelihood of it happening is pretty small unless the Astros clinch and decide to tank the rest of the season and just drop all three games and ball- their entire series in Baltimore. That would make things interesting. That would be must-see TV for baseball. Watching Seattle just crap their pants game after game because they just keep losing ground on that last wild card spot. And then the other thing, too, is Baltimore's behind them, but the White Sox are only one game behind them. Maybe they have an easier path to get some wins with their division. Brian, what do you think? I mean, I appreciate what Andy's saying here because if we lose the series in Baltimore, we can all post check uh, chess, not checkers tweets. Um, <laughs> you know, one step ahead of everyone. Um, you know, it's four games with 17 to play, right? So it would take two things would have to happen. One is a really hot streak by the Orioles or the White Sox and a you know cold snap from the Mariners. They've lost three in a row in 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 Anaheim. That probably indicates they're probably going to win sometime relatively, you know, relatively soon. Possibly today, though. You know, I hope not for the champagne in the dugout scenario. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it would be. It's you know, it's unlikely that they will collapse. It would be a big story, and of course, if they do collapse, part of what will make it more epic, right, is that the Mariners haven't been in the playoffs in two thousand one. They seem like a lock this year. They're still close to a lock. So, over under on the number, uh, Brian. We'll start with you. Then on the number of you got into the into the playoffs on a Mickey Mouse position because it's this sort of controversial third wild card spot um, that looks like they're going to basically eke into. Um, I love that we call the Dodgers World Series Mickey Mouse, even though we would all celebrate it had it gone our way in 2020. So over under on the number of those uh, is it will that be the reaction that non-Mariners baseball has to them getting into the playoffs on that particular scenario. Yeah, I don't... Yeah. One, it's possible they can go on a hot streak and get to the four or five seed. It's really close in the American League uh, among those. And then second, there's been very little talk this year about eking into the sixth seed. Part of that is in the American League. Pretty clear there are six good teams. Um, it's a bigger deal in the National League, I think, where the Padres have celebrated winning the trade deadline by losing the rest of their games. <laughs> I know. That's the bigger story. Andy? Yeah, it's um I, I don't think any I don't think you were gonna hear any eking into the last wild card spot stories, especially if it's the Mariners. And I don't mean this the way it's about to sound, but nobody cares about the Mariners. There's not a outside of the city of Seattle, maybe Idaho and a little bit of uh, Washington or Oregon state. There's just not a lot of national. Oh boy. The Mariners are the, ah, because baseball doesn't promote Julio Rodriguez or any of the other young players they have. If you don't follow baseball, you don't know those guys. So I don't think they are going to make the playoffs within the rules. Good for them. And I say that conversely, if the Astros were in their position and got the sixth wild card, you can hate the Astros, but you can't say people don't care about the Astros right now. They may care to hate them, but they absolutely care about them. And you can witness that by the fact that people like Buster Olney, when they're feeling a little bit like nobody's paying attention to them, will just write an, Ast- an Astros article just to get clicks. Um, that That's – if the Astros were eking into that sixth spot, if the Dodgers were eking into that sixth spot, if the Yankees were eking into that sixth spot, you might hear more of that. Nobody cares who makes that sixth spot until they get to the ALCS potentially. Then it's a story. The extra wild card gave them the opportunity and they ran with it. That would be, that would be the story. Well, and actually what happened in 2020, people were so mad because they did get one of the last 
exactly. And then made it the ALCS. Uh, Brian, did you want to? We already talked about that. Uh, Brian, two things. We'll talk about two more topics quickly before we go. One, the Astros have about 15 games left. Uh, like we talked about earlier, seven and a half game lead for first division. Does for first overall seed, does the what will become an automatic five day layover be- between the end of the season and the first divisional game? Does that mean we won't see a lot of resting players in those last few games? In in because we want to keep people sharp. Yes, and th- it's also that it's also the roster is only twenty eight men, mm-hmm. so you don't have a you kind of have to start some of the regulars every game no matter what. So we'll see more rest. We'll possibly see what's uh, always love the hangover lineup um, the day after the lunch. <laughs> we walk in the clubhouse and say, "Who is actually able to?" Uh, <laughs> Who's able the to of the proper kind of field? Uh, <laughs> the lights there. Hey, David, David Hensley's going to get some PT. Yeah, he is. We might re- we might resign Taylor Jones just for that. Um, uh, what about you, Andy? Is, is that same thoughts on your end that um, we're not going to really be able to do it how it normally might have worked in previous years? Well, I, I, I see especially that last homestand um, against Tampa Bay and Philadelphia. A lot of this guy is going to start, but after he gets two at-bats, he's going to go sit down and Aledmus Diaz is going to play or David Hensley is going to play or you know whoever it might be. Uh, especially I have secured – uh, tickets for the season finale against Philadelphia at three o'clock in the afternoon. I may see starters for about 10 minutes in that game. <laughs> Don't be late. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last uh, thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just, it, it's the nature, as Brian said, there's only 28 players. You don't get to have 35 plus like it used to be um, at the end of the season where you can literally just roll out any lineup because it doesn't roll out matter. the space Cowboys. There you go. Um, yep. All right. Luckily, we didn't have the chance to dive into this. Um, well, I just want to get real quick takes. We'll obviously dive into it a little bit more. One of the things, um, you know, I'm a Cowboys fan. I know exactly what can happen when you have off the field sort of dis- disagreements or divisiveness that can lead to a, the downfall of a franchise. We all know what happened to the 1990s Cowboys, Barry Switzer notwithstanding. The discourse in the discussion over James Click's job, Brian, just real quick, will he be back next year? And will this distraction over will he have a job or not affect the team at all? My guess is yes, but if if Jim Crane really wanted him back, he would have signed him to a contract by now. So I think there's something to the story. Will it distract this team? Hasn't so far, certainly didn't, uh, whether they lost one game since the, since the story broke last Monday. Um, so, right, but that's not being national media being able to ask about it every day during a playoff series. That's what I'm kind of getting at. Does Jose Altuve care who the general manager is? He seems like a nice guy. I don't know. Andy? I, mean, like, I don't think he wishes well on, on, on James <laughs> Click, right? I, you know, I don't, but I don't think that's something that really – I doubt particularly in October, they're going to put a lot of sort of thought and effort into it is a strange and odd story, right? Because, you know, I mean, Jim Crane's statement after, you know, Mark Berman called him up and said, tell me what to write down. um, Wasn't, I want to resign. I want to keep these guys or I'm going to work for these guys. It is. We'll talk about it after the season. It certainly wasn't a vote of confidence. Andy. Yeah, I I don't know how to read it, and I think we're guessing. Uh, to answer your second question first, no, I do not think the players are going to be affected at all. Um, Dusty won't answer the question, even if he's asked every day about the situation, because um, he'll just go on an anecdote that will trail off into nothing about <laughs> onions and pants and things like that. And Hank Aaron. Um, that should be the name of the show, Onions and but Pants. I think, but I think also... James Click, while he did has had a hand in certainly building the roster this year, is not the GM that built the current franchise, if that makes sense. Uh, Jeff Lunau not having his contract renewed in the middle of a playoff run might be a bigger deal because he signed Carlos Correa. He made sure that Altuve had a place on the major league roster and built a team around him. Uh, had Springer, had uh, all the other players that he acquired, Berlander, all those guys. Click is a guy who has done a good job building a bullpen and has gotten some nice bench pieces for us. He hasn't really had the opportunity 
based on a lot of different factors to build the franchise and be really close with these guys. Like they, you know, like, like I would have assumed Lunau was in 2017. Um, having said that, I, I tend to believe there has been a discussion about if that guy comes back, I'm not coming back. Oh yeah. Um, and, and I think that can't be dismissed because it clearly click and dusty are not on the same page about how this team should be run even on a global scale or day to day. Um, I think they coexist. They're both professional. You're not going to see it out in the media, but uh, the trade deadline to me was a pretty big example of one guy not being on the same page as the other guy. And, and the other guy being truculent by not playing the team as constructed. Right. Uh, Brian, is that, do you think that's the only, like, I, I can't point to any one thing that James Click did that would have warranted not getting renewed. Maybe I can't also point to anything that says you're a slam dunk to be renewed. So maybe yeah. that's part of the issue too. But is that something you think is Andy on the right page there? Is there, do you think there's some issue between Dusty and James? You can speculate on lots of things because we have little information other than neither one has a contract for next year. So could Andy be right? Absolutely. Could it be other things? Absolutely, right? We have sort of very little information, very little detail, and we can spin off all sorts of stories uh, about it. Um, you know, James Click is someone who has had good continuity, which is the team is, hey, the team has one, rec one win better than the team at this point in the season, the team he inherited. And part of what he's been able to do is less sort of the moves he's made in sort of acquiring people than it has been to continue the continuity of bringing in players from the system, continuing the high quality development of the Astros minor league system, which is Lunau's greatest accomplishment from my standpoint. And Click's been very good about identifying who in his minor league system is ready to play in the majors. And we've gotten guys like Chaz McCormick, Luis Garcia, uh, now Jeremy Pena, who, because they're all sort of feather in James Click's cap of sort of identifying that these guys are ready to play in the majors, getting them up at the right moment, putting some investment uh, playing time behind them. Does Andy, go ahead, jump in. Please? Sorry. I don't know. Um, bring that and he's not answering questions. And, uh, you know, it probably doesn't have to be Click versus Dusty uh, in my scenario. It could also be that um Dusty's not coming back and Crane has said as father is going to be our manager I promised it to him two years ago and this is what's going to happen and Click wants to run his own search for a, a, a manager and build that staff and he's not going to get the opportunity to do that there could be a number of things I will tell you one thing that is not going to happen that Twitter has already started suggesting kind of um and we've said his name at least twice and if I say it a third time he'll appear uh <laughs> Jeff Lunau is not going to be the next general manager of the Houston Astros no. for the very simple reason that Rob Manfred was not the only person who was tired of Jeff Lunau. Uh, yeah, we've 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 speculated before, maybe not when the show was running, but Andy, you and I privately, that a lot of the ways this punishment being what it was, was because they wanted to get rid of Jeff Lunau. Yeah, I, I can see A.J. Hinch back before Jeff Lunau, and I don't think A.J. Hinch is coming back. Right. All right. We're, let's do we'll do one quick one word answer. Then we'll get out of here. All right, Brian, Team Dusty or Team Click? Team Click, which one do you want? Team Click. Andy, Team Dusty or Team... I don't even have to ask you. Clickety uh, click click. All right, I'm also on Team Click. All right, that does wrap up uh, Go Go Astros. So hopefully, and we'll be real depressed if this doesn't happen, next time we'll be coming back as AL West Division Champions. Um, knowing how slow MLB shop is, it'll take me three months to get that T-shirt when I order it, but we'll be back. All right, everybody, go Strohs. Hey, I've already ordered uh, my long sleeve pullover for the fall. Go Strohs. You can buy those shirts at Academy as soon as the playoffs are over. Go Strohs. Go Go Astros is a presentation from Twitchy Dolphin Media and part of the Let's Get To Baseball Network.